Well, welcome to Really Political. I'm uh, Chip Franklin with uh, Justin Horowitz and, of course, Tom Arnold. You know him, movie star, comedian, activist, friend to animals. Great to be here. Thank you so much, Tom. Justin. Good to be with you, Chip. Uh, I love the energy. I'm feeling it now. Um, you know, this is this is one of those days that uh, we're, I mean, we're, we're, we're laying this for you and you're going to see this live within in the next few hours. But there's so much happening right now. But we, we, before we can move forward, though, I think it's it's only fair that we we ask Tom, who um, and maybe maybe you guys don't know this, but uh, Tom has a long relationship with the former president and uh, and actually has a little inside information on a couple things. And I want to talk about the Secret Service visiting your house in a second. But first, um, there's the story of the, the infamous P tape that took place back during the uh, the Miss Universe contest, I believe it was 2013 in, in Moscow. When apparently uh, Trump had a had a relationship with some uh, professionals, how did that turn out? That you know a little bit about this story? Well, I, the, the guys that went with him, uh, uh, his body man Chuck Labella, who worked on The Apprentice and uh, uh, Miss Universe, uh, came back and told us all of it. You know, I had friends that worked on The Apprentice. In fact, the, the executive producer's brother was my clip producer on my sports show, the best dad sports show period. So there's a, you know, you have access to a lot of different stuff, but he came back and told us of all of what it was like, what Trump did, and that uh, they were in a suite at the Ritz Carlton. And uh, uh, someone told Trump, well, that's the bed that uh, Barack Obama slept on. And he, he, he had, I don't, I'm sure he wasn't paying for it, but six women came up for the party. Uh, I'm sure that somebody uh, close to Putin or whatever said, I can't. Be there, but here, do this. So they came up. There was a scuffle. They get in there, and then Trump is it's like, "Hey, uh, pee on that bed because Barack Obama slept there." So that's that's really, and I assume everything. I lived at the Ritz Carlton in Moscow for the summer of 2015, and I assumed that it was there was cameras everywhere. In fact, I would uh, I, I I wouldn't uh, touch myself for the first week. I was like, don't be, then I then eventually you're like, still, I'm doing that. Wait, I mean, a whole week, Tom? A whole yeah. week? Yeah, well, I, I think it was a week. Yeah. You know, I was working. <laughs> Maybe it was 45 minutes. Yeah, it builds up. 45 minutes. But so he comes back, he tells us that this this happened, that happened, how they Trump got Putin on the laptop and, and Trump, everything is on speakerphone because it's Trump. Everything he always does is on speakerphone. So he came back. It was it was funny and weird and how he uh, it, it stilted to make sure somebody uh, Putin knew won the Miss Universe, like one of his girlfriends. Anyway, you know, all all was well and good till uh, 2015 when Trump started talking about running for president. I'm like, that's I get. I've known him 40 years. Now it's funny because Roseanne, my ex first ex wife of four, hated him. We were together, hated him, and and now she loves like you. She can't say anything. Yeah. You can't be a good comedian and not be able to say anything about Donald Trump or anybody or Joe. Anyway, so I saw this weekend. They said, why do you like, like Trump? And she goes, he did me a favor. Uh, uh, and and I was listening to the favor. And it's like when I when Rosie O'Donnell, when he called her a big fat pig, I said to Roseanne, you got to defend. Yeah, that's our friend. And she goes, well, he didn't call me a big fat pig. And I'm like, OK, that's a terrible. But you see that anyway, 40 years ago. We shot a Roseanne stand-up special. I think I was in it at the uh, at castle, the Trump castle in Atlantic City. And what she was telling people was he did her a favor by letting her shoot her special there. Here's what really happened. We paid for it. And then he was like, before we're getting ready to shoot, he's like, I got a great idea. I know a guy with a uh, Duesenberg, 1930-something. I am going to have that brought here. I'll pay for it. And then I will uh, be Roseanne's chauffeur and drive her up on the on the stage. And and, and Rosanna were like, that's hilarious. Now he's in the show, but the, but it'll be great. So that's what he did. And then two months later, uh, as somebody from HBO or whatever got a hold of me, he said, this farmer that lives in Southern uh, New Jersey uh, boxed up this car and drove it all the way to Atlantic City because Trump said he, he would pay him and he never paid him. So we paid the farmer. So I, I, I don't, Consider that a big favor from uh, Donald Trump, but that's how she is. So just to clarify, though, on the P tape, 
they yeah, were basically it. a group of girls that yeah, came up girls, those... there's been some written about the scuffle at the door and, and uh Trump's made a, a bodyguard, which I wish he would have talked. I can't remember his name, you know. Uh, uh, he retired. I think his wife got sick, and so he never shared his story. But that happened, and then two years later, they they I find out he's running president, and I call the same guys. You got to be public with this. You got to be public. And then uh, they're like, "Whoa, I don't feel comfortable. I don't want to lose my job." Mark Burnett just signed me to whatever, and I'm just like, and then in 2016, I'm like, "This is we had. You have to do everything. You need the tapes, uh, the outtakes from the, the Apprentice, where Trump says all these horrible things and." Points to the camera as a, a woman, a camera, a camera woman, and he just would always do, uh, "You're effable." He would say, "Effable." I'm doing that for Chip. You're eff- you're fuckable. You're fuck. I mean, oh, again and again and again. And remember, this show, The Apprentice, had 18 cameras inside the uh, Trump uh, uh, office, and they filmed every moment. They had to legally film every moment from the moment he got out of his car till the moment he got back in his car at the end of the day, because there's a federal law. You can't fake a game show, and it's a game show. You have to film every moment of the host, no matter what. That way, you, they can't say, oh, the, the commercial people, they bribed them to make somebody win because they had this game show scandal in the 50s. I think it was a $54,000 question where they fake stuff, and they're like, from now on, it's a federal scene. So they, uh, they have all of this stuff, all every moment. Of, of, and so uh, and then people started talking. I shared about it, of course. I shared about the whole thing in this. In, uh, fall of uh, uh, 2016, and then people started, and I was urging my friends who were still working for Mark Burnett to please come forward. I ended up uh, with Mark Burnett at uh, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's Christmas party. This is after Trump won the election, and all the Republicans were like, don't worry, he's going to be presidential, give him a chance. And so Mark Burnett comes up, we're over there, and I said, why? I need to have why don't you tell the truth about Trump? And he holds up his phone, and it's a picture of his kid as Trump's rig rig bear. He's like, "That's why." I go, "Okay, but uh, I want I want those tapes, and uh, you don't have to admit giving them to me. And just it's going to be a lot of work." And he goes, "No, no, you want the tapes, and Trump wants the tapes, and I'm not giving them to either one of you guys." And then we end up in a, like a brawl where yeah, you know, and people are lining up on one side. You know, Arnold has a lot of Republican friends. Lighting up, lighting up. They're saying Hillary Clinton is the closest thing to Hitler, which is crazy. And then my friend, who is, is the executive producer of, of The Apprentice, the guy that talked to Trump before every take, the closest human being to him, steps up and goes, no, Donald Trump is the worst human being I've ever met in my life. And so I, I was like, he stood up, man. He did that. So I got to leave. So I said, I need to exit this situation. And I get out. There's a valet at Arnold's. And there's been a wreck down the street, so it's taking a long time. And I'm like, I got to just get out of here, man. And I also behind me, Clint Eastwood walks up and goes, hey, Tom, you know, you know, Trump is a bonehead. He goes, you know, the thing is, uh, it, it's a lot of fun to run for mayor. But then if you get elected, you got to be mayor. And I always remember it's such good uh, advice. Yeah. From- heavy as the crown. Heavy as the crown, oh. right? Yeah. I, I got to say, David Corn and Michael Iskoff tracked that PV peace tape story. Two, and you can see in their book, they have a picture of Trump at a pee show in Vegas, a late night show where hot for teach or something, where a, a woman is peeing into a, a champagne flute, which is hard. And he's watching it in the audience, like, boy, the light bulb. This is right before he went to Russia for the boy, you see the light bulb. Man, that's something. Maybe I'll recreate that. So, yeah. I got a so, question for you. Um, first of all, on the um, Burnett's tapes, you said there's some horrible stuff on there. Does that include the N word? Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. It includes the Edward, uh, just, just uh, you know, stuff that they had to pull it, try to pull him out of there and talk to him. And people, you know, there were several times. And, and that's why I was hoping the California, uh, uh, w- whatever it is, the workers' rights law would, you know, get their hands on that. I mean, I tried. It's funny. I, I knew where they stored it in a salt mine in Hutchinson, Kansas, where MGM stores all their stuff. And I had a guy go in there and, and take a picture of what the rack looked like, you know, where you would find the episodes of the show, as well as the outtakes. And I was trying to figure out how to get into that salt mine. If, you know, I knew a, a forklift driver. I knew it would have been a lot of work, and I don't think I could have got it. But I think one day, because every time they syndicate The Apprentice to show, they have to include the outtakes. You cannot buy The Apprentice 
without getting the outtakes because legally that goes with it. But that's why they didn't want the Chinese to buy The Apprentice. They made bids for it. And they're like, yeah, we are going to be able to control them with the outtakes. So but one day, one day it'll be it'll come out. Do you think that Putin is leveraging this against do you think that the P tape is leveraging that against Trump or would it really even affect his base now if that came out? I mean, they didn't pee on no. him. They peed on a bed. I don't think it would. No, it wouldn't affect his base. But Putin is and, and a guy, Putin, a friend of his, Michael Cohen. I think Michael's talked about this. Uh, he called him during the right up before the election. A friend from Russia says, listen, there are tapes. But don't worry. We, we're at there. We're at, we're controlling them. Don't worry. Tell him not to worry. We have them. But. Uh, you know, they're probably not going to see the light of day. And then Michael Cohen used that. I mean, I'm, I'm proud of Michael Cohen's that great. But he used that when he went to Jerry Falwell Jr. after Trump lost the Iowa caucus or whatever and uh, and said to Jerry Falwell Jr., listen, remember when I helped you with that uh, the naked stuff with your wife and you and, and the pool <laughs> boy? Well, I've still got one of those pictures. And <laughs> I would appreciate you doing us a favor. And supporting Donald Trump, and that's he, as you know, he supports Donald Trump instead of Ted Cruz, who is a evangelical, uh, and his dad is a preacher. And, and, and Jerry Falwell made the decision: okay, I'm going to do this thing. <laughs> I'm going to say Trump is most like Jesus. So, no, his base well, that you cannot, they'll never, you know, they don't care. Yeah. Why do you why do you think Burnett is keeping these secrets? Does he just want to appear to be like this network executive who keeps his clients and his, you know, their he's dealings a, secret or what? At one time he was the biggest producer in Hollywood, most money. He's made hundreds of millions of dollars for Trump, which means Trump has also made an unusual amount of money for him. And it's really about money. You know, Burnett uh he, he you know, talks about being Christian and really, you know, but I think Burnett's the kind of guy that will be whatever. You know, when he started that music show, or whatever it's called, suddenly the people on the show said he came dressed like a musician, like he was acting like a musician. Then when he started Survivor, they'd say he comes to set dressed like a survivor on the, you know, I think Mark Burnett, he worked, a, he was a, a merchant marine or whatever. First of all, he talks about being a special ops uh, 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 officer, but it's in the UK, so it's not quite as, but he and I got, got a full-on fist fight, and he is not. <laughs> tough i mean he, he's not tough and uh but i think he just is a chameleon he'll be whatever you know his wife may work very well be a christian or whatever but he'll be whatever and i assume by now it's hurt him because he knows more about trump he knows he's but he also tried to do a show with putin in 2015 like he mm. has no you know they'll he would do for money he would do anything so that too is uh, people in my business know that now which is a good thing. Okay, so you've known Trump 40 years. Yeah. How d- describe the events that had the secret service knocking at your door. What did you say or do to get these guys to come check on Tom Arnold? Again, I knew him friendly. 40 years he'd come on my sports show and he and he also did a thing where it makes you feel really good. He's like, "Before we start, I'm only here because Tom Arnold asked me to come here." Like it makes you you get a little tingle in your spine. Oh, oh he likes me. And uh uh what after the show one time he said, Hey, I got a new vodka over. I'm releasing it at Playboy Mansion. Will you come and with me? And I go, sure. He goes, My new girlfriend, you can meet her, Karen McDougal. I go, well, that's amazing. So go there with him. I meet his new girlfriend, a playmate of the year, I believe, dressed like a playmate of the year, Karen McDougal, very nice cute. And then he's like, Oh yeah, Melania's here too. And his daughter. <laughs> they all posed together in picture. And I remember thinking, that is balls of steel. He should never be the president because he generally doesn't care. So during the 2018, uh, he, uh, there's a guy, a congressman up in Montana or some, Greg, I think he might be the governor of Montana. I know. Anyway, uh, <laughs> he wrote a small journalist, I think for the Washington Post, a little guy. He body slapped him because he didn't like his question. And so that was kind of a big uh, thing. And then Trump was obsessed with it. And he would say to his rallies, I want to body slap somebody. I want to body slap. And, uh, uh, you know, Trump is... Uh, uh, you know, six two, maybe six three, whatever, three hundred pounds, and uh, but he's also in the WWE Hall of Fame. Let me tell you, I have so much respect for the WWE Hall of Fame. But you, you should, he shouldn't be in there unless he's going to prove it. You know, Dan Gable's a friend of mine. I went to the University of Iowa. I love Dan. 
he get, Trump gave him the Medal of Freedom or whatever it is and at the White House. And Trump looked at him, this is on camera, and said, you're a little guy. I, I wonder if I could take you. And uh, he said, you would have no shot. He made T-shirts. But he don't. So anyway, I, I put out, I, uh, I will come to any event, any Trump rally, and we will wrestle on stage, body slam. Each, uh, whoever wins, wins. If I lose, I will not bring it up again. And then I get a call from the Secret Service, and it's a supervisor in L.A., and she's like, this is embarrassing, but we need to come over and do an interview with you. And I'm like, why? Well, you said you would wrestle uh, the president. So <laughs> he came over, and it was such an honor because of what they do. These are the people that are right between Trump and, you know, when he starts his trouble with stuff, these are the people that get hurt, you know. So I, I, I enjoyed myself for a couple hours, uh, told every story I knew. And then uh, the guy at the end is like, uh, and I told every crazy fight story. I'm like, these guys will listen to this. But it's, he said, hey, if you're back in Iowa and you run into Trump, are you going to throw down on him? And I'm like, if I'm back in Iowa and I happen to run into Trump on the sidewalk, I am going to confront him. I, I will 100% get in his face. And uh, because that's something that's super effective. And I found that with Michael Cohen or whoever, you hear these mystical things about how tough these guys are. And then you get up in their face, you're like, oh, that's that's just not the case. So, uh, yeah, and then they said, well, that would be bad. And then I took down the, because they were leaving my house in Beverly Hills to fly to Florida to arrest Caesar Satok, as I say in his name, right? A guy that was setting pipe bombs and threatening also. So they went from my house and they, they told me before I left, we know who the guy is. And we're going to go get him, which is a relief because he was setting up the, celebrities or whatever and uh but i i took it down the post because i think it about these guys you know uh, uh they have a hard job and they're like what if one of your super fans <laughs> read what you wrote and uh, tries to uh re tackle trump or whatever well, and, good, yeah. thing, good thing they didn't screw those visits up tom you could be in gitmo right now you know yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, and meanwhile, Trump put out a video a couple of days ago where he's got Biden gagged and bound in the back right. of a trunk. So does the offer still stand, though, to, to wrestle yeah, Trump? And, and I said to the agents, I, I filmed it all. What about, okay, you got me for this joke. What Every day Trump tries to incite violence. Every day. What do you do about that? And they said, we have warned him a thousand times. So they were aware. Yeah, that's all. I mean, Trump is just seeing what he can do and what he, how far. And it's not just him seeing. This is who he is. Like, this is not, he's the same guy he always was. You know, he's authentically terrible. That's really who he is. It's the other people around him, the enablers that have changed. They've changed what they care about, this and that. But he's just an authentically terrible person. And people, you know, and it, this happens in every generation. There's a group of white people. The average it didn't happen in the South, they have here, where they're like, oh, we we need to know we're better than the best uh, black person. Or, you know, we need to have somebody tell us that. And so that is Trump. And they're like, that's our guy. He is just like us. He's awful, just like it. He's our guy. And what ends up happening is somebody like Trump will start losing, which he has, run their course. And that generation of white people who are, who are worshiping it, they stay the same. But the people of color around them and women have moved up a notch. And these white people stay in the same spot. And hopefully they it seems like they would realize that because at the end they're going to go, oh, shoot, that was bullshit. Oh, that. Oh, oh my God. Why did I do that? Well, I think we're getting near that, though, Tom. I think we're approaching that. Uh, you're watching Really Political with Tom Arnold, Justin Horwitz. I'm Chip Franklin. Um, let's bring in uh, our our. Well, one of the early, really American uh, authors here. He's the, uh, the he, is, he is the true spirit of the undercurrent, underbelly of the United States. Some we don't, from an undisclosed location. T Pain joins us here <laughs> on Really American. What's up, Big T? Howdy, brothers and sisters. <laughs> oh, hey, buddy. I tell you, last time I talked, you were in your pickup, which is as authentic as I could. Uh, even though you're from Missouri, from that was Iowa. actually T Pain's 1984 Winnebago Brave. Is that right? Nice. <laughs> Nice, t -Pain. Just got a new set of tires for my house. <laughs> um, hey, T, you obviously you got your finger on the pulse of everything that's happening right now. And there's so much happening, obviously, with with Trump and, you know, the indictments and the delays. Um, what's your sense now when you open the window? Where's the wind blowing? 
Well, I think people are getting tired of Trump. Uh, Trump fatigue is real. Even down here in Gizzard Ridge, uh, people have had enough of it. Uh, there's people that just don't want to talk about Trump no more. People, you couldn't get them to shut up four years ago. You, you couldn't back them into a corner anymore. Yeah. I mean, we used to have Liz Cheney and Kinzinger. Now it's grown. You got Gallagher, you got Buck, you got a whole lot, a lot of congressmen. Johnson's losing control. You see Green flipping out. Um, but yeah, Dennis, see, I don't know who any of those people are. What? <laughs> but hey, doesn't it feel like we've been here before, you guys? That like, I mean, I remember with Comey, I go, oh, that's it now. And then Mueller, oh yeah. And Garland, he won't fuck around. Now, I just, my sense is, is that, you know, we always get to this point. Now we got Cannon and the Supreme Court pushing the delays back. Are we going to get a trial before the election? Here's the thing. Liz Cheney last week, this week, spoke in Iowa to 4,000 Republicans yeah. that have had it. That to me, oh, sure. you know, that shows a lot. Thank God for Liz Cheney. Thank God for being eloquent about this thing. Going, Joe Biden sucks, but he's nothing like Trump. Trump is, that's unacceptable. That, if that's the message, I'll take it. So they are, but Chip, you do feel this traumatized. I see it on when it was first happening and people were like, okay, they're going to arrest Trump and the, the Supreme Court's going to arrest him or whatever. He's going to take him out. And I always felt like, well, that's a little, that's a nice thing to believe in. But then the people that were uh, pushing that uh, got beaten down and got beat. And, and what you realize is if you're going to say something about Trump, there's 10 people that are going to threaten you or do all this stuff. That's the nature of this thing. And you could feel good people, women, uh, getting beaten down by that and kind of slipping off of social media, people that did great jobs. I think now people are kind of rested up. They're like, okay, what do we got? Six months in the summer. Okay, we can do this one more time. Because it was beating him by 7 million votes in 2020. Seems like it would have put him down. Like if it was a horse, you would have taken him out. But no, he's like, as a matter of fact, I, I didn't lose. I'm just going to keep saying that thing. And it, what, what America are sore losers. Are not, there's nothing more American than a sore loser. <laughs> if Bill Belichick lost Super Bowl and then bitched about it for three years, people are like, I have no respect for Bill Belichick. But that, so it's so un American, but people are like, okay, let's keep thinking of stuff. So we got to do it one more time. You know, okay. T Brain's most interested in, in politics down here on the street level. And, and what he's seeing is there's people, there's voters getting tired, of all the bloodbathing and the Bible selling and the Biden getting kidnapped and judges' daughters getting threatened. And this kind of stuff is just toxic to the regular open-minded voter. There's like three of them down here. And those people are tired of this stuff. Yeah. Who are they going to vote for, though? The and there's people like this all over the country. Who are they going to vote for? Are they going to vote for Biden? Are they going to stay home? They're going to stay home. That's how most of these people, they're going to stay home and they're going to tell their friends they voted. And they're going to tell their friends they voted for Trump. Yeah, And that's fine with T-Pain. Mm. Yeah, that's fine. I like that. That's, no is the second best answer. Mm. Uh, T-Pain, do you feel like there's a lot of people, I'm from a tumble Iowa with T-Pain. That's, a, that's a, a pretty redneck area. Do you feel like there's a lot of people <laughs> that, that probably know inside it's all true about Trump, but can't because he's such a victim. They, they, they're, they're, everybody's out to get Trump. We need to support him. He's doing it for us. Do you, they, how many, what percentage of people where you live still think like that? Like, no matter what you say, nope, nope, he is a victim. I don't believe that. They don't have any access to media that might be different than their point of view. And uh, what percentage of people well, where you live? Well, people can do the math on that. There's 57 people here in Gizzard Ridge, and there's three of them. That's about 6%. Oh, that's uh, very scientific. Yeah. Is it you know, six? Nine. nine. I can't. I rely on So wait, tell me this, T. What was it about? And this is something that Tom alluded to earlier. Um, what, the, Trump would never have anything to do with the people in your neighborhood ever on any day of the week. Never. You, you think they're going to go to Mar-a-Lago and have champagne? So what was the uh, allure? What was the attraction to him over Somebody that says, we're going to come down there and, and, and fix your water and your air and your roads, the Democrats. Well, why did this happen? Well, that's a good question, Chip. It started about three or 4,000 years ago <laughs> when some fellow figured out that you process religion and politics uh, to the same part of the brain, you know, that you also reserve for methamphetamines. <laughs> and what they do is they figured out a way to kind of weave their political message 
into their political agenda. And that's how people accept it without thinking or questioning it. Yeah, that you know, is, we, yeah. Whenever somebody makes that point, whenever somebody makes a point like that, we like to reward them with the uh, really political how. There you go. So congrats, T. Oh, my God. That's <laughs> hey, tell you what, fellas. Uh, at, over at the skid mark this afternoon, this fella came over and confronted T-Pain. And he looked at him. He said, T-Pain, you got Trump derangement syndrome. And T-Pain said, I reckon you're right. But I've also got Hitler derangement syndrome and Mussolini derangement syndrome. That's very uh, true. It's so many people have a problem with that comparison, but it's so apt and so overlooked that he had his speeches next to his bed. And that was a sworn deposition by Trump's wife. What did he like to read at night? He would open up Trump Hitler's speeches and he would just fast. That's the only it. thing you could get him to well, read. There's, that's, there's a reason for this. Now, if, if, if T-Pain saw this too, over the weekend, what happened? We had everybody, all the MAGAs were fussing about having to share Easter with the trans community, right? But then they got found out just yesterday that next Easter, Easter is on Hitler's birthday. <laughs> and they said, they said that's cool because Easter's all about sharing. <laughs> There's a big out that, that uh, uh, the FBI is arresting Catholics and infiltrating. Uh, you know, I'm Jewish, so I don't know a lot about Easter, except the Easter Bunny. My kid, we celebrate any holiday with candy. My kids are eight and ten. <laughs> anyway, but. Uh, uh, they, 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 they keep talking about uh, Easter and, and uh, offending, whatever, and arresting Catholics. But did it? they have to arrest a lot of Catholics not that long ago who were molesting and sexual assaulting children? And it was part of the systemic, for years and years and years, tens of thousands of kids, like for years, and they covered it up. And covered, you see it in the Southern Baptist Convention right now. Every religion goes through this, Boy Scouts, whatever. But if that were a private business, and I, I have a lot of friends that are Catholic, but this is a private business, and they go, okay, we've uh, sexually assaulted 25,000 kids. It, you'd be off. You wouldn't be able to sell your hamburgers or bullshit. So yeah. they should feel lucky because sometimes they, uh, the law enforcement does need to look at the Catholic Church and, um, and whatever. I grew up Catholic, and my mom always told me I should marry the first person I had sex with. And I said, I can't see me spend the rest of my life with Father O'Reilly. It just didn't didn't compute. It really. Biden's DOJ treated Catholics like terrorists. If you were a practicing Catholic, you were a domestic terrorist. If you bought a Bible, you were marked by your banks, and that information was given to said FBI and DOJ. They think church-going patriots are terrorists. You know what? And that's <laughs> uh, it would honestly be funnier if it weren't so insane. God, Junior. Uh, now that uh, is proof. That is proof positive that Junior's been dancing in the devil's dandruff. Yeah. Well, he in the, yeah in the nineties he got arrested for uh, uh, being drunk and uh, drugs. His dad kicked him out of the family for a year, and my friend, me and my friends took care of him for a year. Took it to uh, my friends in Colorado. We took it to Bowie with us. We had always had family things that and I would talk wait, to. Wait, him. Wait, so wait, say, say that again. You helped Don Jr. through a period of yes. time? Yes. In the 90s. It, you know, I used to uh, kind of sponsor a lot of younger people. We'd go. But it, myself, my friends in uh, uh, Colorado, they really took care of it because he had nobody. His dad would not speak to him. And I, I said to him, okay, your dad's a. Your dad's an asshole. We know that. But, yeah. but you know what? People look at uh, addiction differently. And I'm sure he thinks it's a weakness, but look around. I'm, I'm in recovery. All these people, there's fun people. And so really spent the time with that, but it also made me feel for him. Now, when he starts this shit, when he's 50 years old, that's unacceptable. But they had a horrible, uh, uh, Trump's first wife uh, accused him of raping her. Don did not speak to Trump for a year after that. No kidding. So he got over that. He's apparently forgive and forget and just keep spouting. Because at first you're like, these are somebody's kids. Not, you can't make fun of the president's kids, but they're like, oh no, we're gonna we're gonna do this thing. We're all in. Yeah. So Dr. They're way, is, they're way everything. too involved to evade scrutiny. Maybe that, Barron's that is, a little bit off limits, but everyone is, else is like 
Trump Jr. People were saying wanted to run for president next. I mean, it's like, yeah, that's oh, nice. that's Justin Horowitz and uh, Tom Arnold. T Pain, we'll see you next week, my friend. Thank you, great stuff as always. Be well. Hi, right, everybody. All right. Hey. Let me just remind everybody you're watching uh, Really Political, and please subscribe to us on the Really American Network on uh, YouTube, and uh, we will get notifications to you when we get our, our videos up and all. Um, one of the things that that we talk a lot about, obviously, is uh, the the threat to this nation, the national security threat that is Donald Trump, and and of course, in in many cases, it extends to uh, to the situation with Zelensky and Ukraine and Putin, and and where all that is headed. That's why we're so excited to have this next guest on. Uh, Frank Vigluzzi is a former assistant director of the FBI. He's also the national security contributor for MSNBC and the author of some great books. Uh, and I've read them both. I don't know if I'm supposed to say I've read the second one since it's not technically out yet, but he'll tell me in a minute. The first one was the FBI way. Uh, the next one, I'll let him explain and tell me if I stepped over uh, the way right now. Frank joins us here on Really Political. Frank, good to see you, my friend. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Tom, Justin, Chip, you're not supposed to say what you just said. So there you, there you go. I can no. cut it out. I can I, cut I, it out. No, no, I'm just kidding. Okay, good. Frank, good. Frank here's the deal. I have been a fan of yours. You're just solid. Whatever I see, you're going to be on a show. You're solid. I have a lot of respect for your other career, too. But until today, I thought it was Frank Faguzzi. No wonder I had trouble looking you up. <laughs> but there, but there is Fug, Faguzzi. No, don't feel bad. I, I've been called, <laughs> I called him Frank Faguzzi for about media. a month, and he didn't correct me. And he finally said, no, no Chip. I'm too no, polite I, on that. But I, Chip's right about that. But yeah, if you look at my social media, I've been called much worse than Figuzzi. But it, yeah, it, it is Figuzzi. If, if you want to be really Italian, it's Figuzzi. Figuzzi, the G and the L. The G becomes uh, kind of silent, but now we're into a language lesson. But uh, so, yeah. So, you know, Chip, you called me and you said, hey, how about, uh, how about real, uh, a poli what is this called? Really political, right? Really political, yeah. Yeah. And I said, Chip, I'm really not political. I'm national security. And, uh, he said, well, you're going to come on anyway, because these days everything has become political, even sadly, our national security. Let me ask you a question right up front. Um, is Biden within his rights to not give Trump a security briefing, an intel, an intel briefing over the summer? Yeah, this is damned if you do, damned if you don't, right? You rile up the Trump base even more if you deny him what is typically done for every major candidate. But, you know, there is a way to split the split the baby here, which is to give uh, a briefing that really is not classified. It could be sensitive. But, you know, here's why they give these briefings traditionally to leading candidates, majority candidates, and typically after the convention and the nomination is solid. Um, and that's simply to keep them from screwing things up. Don't press any buttons, right? Don't come out and say, um, you know, something like, uh, yeah, we should bomb Gaza tomorrow because we're in the middle of a negotiation. Or, you know, we we think the Wall Street Journal reporter who's been held wrongfully in Russia, you know, should get out tomorrow. No, don't say that because we're, we're actually close to doing something. Don't tip the scales here. That's what those briefings are about. That That's about it. And so you can do that in an unclassified way. Will Trump respect anything he's told? Absolutely not. Of course not. But you can do it so that we're giving you something. We've told you not to screw up. It allows Biden to say, you know, I told Trump not not to say that about the North Korean submarine, but God darn it, he said it. Now, Frank, I have a question for you as the former assistant director of the deep state. Um, <laughs> RFK. When you, when you say former, how do you know I'm really retired? How do you know? <laughs> so RFK Jr. went on CNN yesterday, and I, I think we have the clip of where he basically said, Biden is the bigger threat to democracy than Trump. And the reason he gave was he said that the Biden administration was working. Let's play it. Let's play it. Yeah. Let's play it right here. But do you really believe that when people talk about the threat to democracy that Trump poses, do you really think that that is, is this an equal yeah, evil I mean, to I, Biden? I, I mean, listen, I can make the argument that President Biden is a much worse threat to democracy. And the reason for that is President Biden is the first candidate in history, the first president in history that has used the federal agencies to censor political speech, so to censor his opponent. I, you know, I can say that because I just won a case in the Federal Court of Appeals and now before the Supreme Court that shows that he started censoring not just me. For 37 hours after he took the oath of office, he was censoring me. No president in the country has ever done that. Wow. Okay. 
But yeah. along along with that statement, it's his is exactly what Elon Musk is basically saying every day in that cohort of right wingers that the big scandal was Biden particularly working with intel agencies and the FBI to censor political speech on Twitter. Yeah. Is that true at all? Yeah. No, except nobody will listen except people who have an open mind and want to research the facts. So the, the reality with that whole Twitter scandal is that the FBI, by the way, it's not just Twitter, the, the FBI pays visits um, to other social media platforms when they identify a potential threat and they don't give instructions. We still live in a free and democratic society, believe it or not. And what they do is they, they have security on speed dial at all the major platforms. And they say, look, heads up, heads up. We think this is a Russian operation. We think this ad that you're, you're, you're allowing to, to post is from Russian intelligence. Here's why. We, we'd like you to be aware, remain aware of that, and that this is being used by Russian intel as disinformation or propaganda. Have a nice day. That's essentially what that consisted of. It's been turned into the FBI, controlled by Biden's White House, paid visits to uh, social media platforms and told them to pull things. That, that the facts, if you actually dig into the facts, even Elon Musk will tell you we were never told to pull anything. We were we were briefed on a potential threat. So Elon hammers this home more than anything. And he says all day, this is this is the biggest threat, the FBI. If he really knows what you're saying to be true, do you think then what Elon's doing, spreading this knowingly false allegation, attacking our intel agencies, do you think he himself is a threat to national security? I, well, so let me let me start with a large picture. I think social media writ large is one of our most troubling problems in society right now. It is more negative than positive through my national security lens, and it is the major tool for spreading disinformation and propaganda. It's got us in this mess in a big way, and they're doing very little to get us out of the mess. So Elon Musk would be the worst offender. So if he knows the facts, and actually, if you go way back in his earliest days at Twitter, you'll see him conceding, yeah, yeah, they never actually told us to pull anything off. But now, he's, as you say, he's, he's twisted that. And why? Why? It gets him his base, which intersects with Trump's base, gets him followers, and gets people riled up. And most of all, puts Elon Musk in the center of the radar screen, which is where he wants to be. Yeah. How do you, how do you explain if you got two hundred billion dollars, you think you'd be like, and you created the, you got rockets, you got the electric. You think that'd be enough? But but he's a Michael Bay. He needs to be Joe Rogan too. He's tried to be as funny and provocative as Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan, whatever you say about, it, he was he's a comedian, and uh, and that. But he's like, that's what I want to be. I'm going to steal the whole thing. I'm going to I'm going to support Trump, even though Trump doesn't like electric cars. I mean, there's nothing that makes. And he said by this. Yeah, no, you, you've hit it on the head. Why in God's name would a billionaire who's got all of this going on for him need to put himself in the center of this mess? It's, it's an ego that is equal to or greater than Donald Trump's. He yeah. loves being, being that guy who, makes, who calls the shots, who's on, who's off, who do I don't like? This guy who's supposed to be all about freedom of speech, right, has done nothing but kick people off, whether you're talking about Don Lemon or yeah. someone else. And he sets the rules. He, he loves it. And it's dangerous. The, that size ego with money and power and the power of the pen in the form of, of social media is extremely dangerous. Oh, well, you know, Mark K. Jr., I've done him a long time. I know his family, you know, the, 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 not just the Schwarzenegger side, but a bunch. And he used to be, like, legit. Like, he had this thing called Water Keepers. And we used to go around and raise money to keep the rivers and the water clean, like he was a legit, he was legit solid. Yeah, and Hudson then, River, Hudson River cleanup yeah, is yeah. RFK. Yeah. yeah, and then something happened, uh, and, and and it's ego, I'm sure, uh, but it's like, okay, that's not enough, you know. I've got it. By the way, he has a great sobriety story. He was a heroin addict. He recovered. He he works on. So that part is is great. But something in his head, and, and as he's going, I I, I think I could be president. Uh, and I'm going to go to whoever will have me. If Fox News has me, that too side of on. That's it's just like Trump. He's like I uh, Proud Boys like me. I like the Proud Boys. Uh, David Duke, I don't care. 
whoever likes me, that's where I'm going. He's tailored his message. And uh, at first I felt sorry for him. I was like, okay, because he does have a lot of baggage that people don't Huge. know about paying Huge. off. Tell us more. Tell us more. Yeah. <laughs> I know two nannies that he had to pay off. And at first I was like, let's not go there. But now, now Did you say like, nannies? Did you say yeah. nannies? Yeah. Situations oh, with the, the nannies. They said, let's not go there yet. But uh, you have to. Uh, you, you hate doing he that. Kept but... he, kept, he kept the diary of his conquest. He did he not? Hey, can I just say this? As an Irish Catholic kid, you know, I grew up adoring these guys. But, you know, the truth is not kind to this legacy. I mean, Joe Kennedy was a bootlegger. Uh, 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 J, uh, R, JFK got us into Vietnam. RFK uh, uh, wired uh, the uh, Dr. King. And then, of course, Tenny Kennedy couldn't find a bridge he could cross. And so you look at this, these stories and you ask yourself right now, you know, why are we why is this guy in the conversation? This is a guy that told in an, in an article that he thought the Chinese manufactured COVID to save Jews and Chinese. He said that. I mean, I not only is that anti-Semitic, it's 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 in, injurious. It's bad. He's, he, he says that children be, shouldn't be vaccinated for MMS. I mean, there's a lot. MMR, excuse me. There's a lot here about him that's just played out wrong. But I want to ask you a real quick question about because we're going to have Lev Parnas on in a few minutes. And I want to ask you about uh, Ukraine and Russia. And in your mind, what poses the greatest risk to the United States? Us not continuing aid to Ukraine and letting them come right into NATO or the possibility of a nuclear exchange between uh, Putin and the U.S.? We, we need so it's we need to contribute aid in a way that gets us a win and gets Ukraine to win. Not not drips and drabs. The, the mistake that's been made all along here has been giving aid, um, you know, in, in a gentle way that keeps the fight going, but doesn't get a decisive win. So the, the way this needs to go is to, to come right out and say, and Biden should do this. We are, you know, people say, oh, we're in a proxy war. Yet you bet we are in a proxy war in Ukraine. We are. And you know why? Russia is bad. You know, just call it. Russia is an adversary. They get up every day trying to hurt us and trying to, to take more free countries in Eastern Europe. That's where they want to go. They are our adversary. I worked against them for 25 years and then headed up counterintelligence in the FBI. And they couldn't be happier with the polarization and the level of discord inside the United States. The only way to do this without U.S. boots on the ground there is to absolutely give decisive winning aid to Ukraine now, now. Um, and, and that's what we're fighting for. We're either, we're either supporting democracy and free people or we're not. And we need to come out and call it. Don't be afraid to say, yeah, we are in a proxy war. That's right. And here's why. Yeah. I also think, I also think about that what's going on in Gaza, uh, the fact that what Joe Biden is doing, that the far left is bad, the far right is bad. So that always tells me, whenever that happens, that the president is doing the right thing, because he's doing, you know, it's in somewhere in the middle here. I think he's doing a masterful job of it. I, I think it's so complicated. It's so, you know, people, but he's doing the right thing. The loudest voice is, Tom, you've you, you got a point, which is something that I, I, I continue to emphasize is we're missing the middle. We're missing the middle. If, if the far left is pissed and the far right is livid, Something the so people in the middle are going, yeah, I get I get it. Okay, I get it. And and that's that is the majority, but the loudest voices are controlling the narrative. Now I will tell you, you know, we've gotten the news in the last 24 hours that humanitarian workers with the uh the, the central kitchen with Chef Andre um have been have been killed and it's not looking good. The facts, uh the videos, the targeting of those vehicles is is looks very deliberate to me. And uh, I'm very concerned. And the response from Netanyahu has been, uh, these things happen uh, in war. But, you know, there's no deconfliction mechanism in place. So as you say, behind the scenes, I guarantee you the U.S. government is feverish, feverishly working to say, we can do this. Do you need help with deconfliction? Do you, do you need a, a war room that shows where the humanitarian workers are? You know, so we can we can stop this. Let, let, are you for real or are you not? Um, but yes, uh, when when er, when either fringe side is pissed, you're probably doing something right. But Kevin, also, what you just said. About, 
Go ahead, Tom. I'm Jewish. I'm Jewish. And, uh, you know, I've seen the Hamas. I went down to the Museum of Tolerance and watched the whole Hamas. Uh, awful. Their tape of, of what the butchering and slaughtering people is disgusting. You can also think, boy, these people, uh, Palestinians, are screwed over by everybody, including Arabs. Nobody wants, they, there has to be a better way. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, Trump, uh, and then you, I always tell people, be careful of this. People will say, I support Israel. Uh, we hate, uh, and I always tell my Jewish friends, they support Israel. They don't support Jews. <laughs> it's just that right now they hate Muslims more, and it'll be LGBTQ people and, and uh, people of color. Where remember, we're always next. As Jews, we know we are always next. So the great thing about being an American Jew is I can have a, a opinions about how their government is working. I don't like that, Yahoo. People don't, you know, that's my opinion. This needs to end. They need to get the hostage back, and it needs to end. And hopefully, unfortunately, the history of the United States, it takes something like the Belay Massacre or something just awful, like these aid workers getting killed, that, that people are like, okay, let's put the, that's going to look terrible. Let's put the brakes on that. Yeah, and on that note, Frank, because that's terrible. If they're targeting those humanitarian aid workers, that's crazy. So Chuck Schumer got a lot of flack when he called for basically saying we need elections in Israel now. Right. Netanyahu's driving Israel off a cliff. You're going to lose public support from the world. You're going to turn yourself into a pariah state. Republicans obviously fired back saying, oh, you're meddling in their elections from a national security point of view. I mean, I know it's obviously a little bit political. Does, does Chuck Schumer right? I mean, does does Israel need to get rid, hold elections and get rid of Netanyahu so they get back on track? And how close is Israel to becoming a pariah state if what you're saying is true? Yeah, I, I think they're they're at risk right now. You know, if this were a PR campaign, they'd be losing the PR campaign. Um, and I don't mean to denigrate how serious this is, it, it, but but they have to win the hearts and minds of of the world right now. And they're not doing it very well. So is is the middle of a war. And by the way, not so much a war. They kicked ass. They are kicking ass. Of course. Of course they are. So. You know, people say, well, in the middle of a war, is that a good time to have a, a have a, a public dialogue on reelecting a president or, or a new guy? Um, probably not the best time. However, comma, let me put my national security hat on. My major concern here is that having worked against Hamas, they are cold stone killers. No question about it. They are terrorists of the of the most evil variety. And if they win, start getting the sympathies of the world. Um, we've we've got a problem. And from a recruitment standpoint, the worst thing you could do is complete is is complete annihilation of Gaza to the point of tens of thousands of innocent lives, women and children continue to die. And that is the biggest recruitment poster for new terrorists, because I know Netanyahu keeps saying we're going to destroy Hamas. You're, you're not going to destroy Hamas if you keep inciting other terrorists to come and join. Um, one last question. Can I plug the book that's coming out? Yeah, let's do it real, real briefly without, you know, ruin any book launch exclusive interview. It's a. Can I say that I've read it? Yes. It's kick ass. It's a great book. It's Thank you. and it's well, no, I mean, I traveled around the country. It's about long. It's about truckers as serial killers, and it's all yeah. true. Yeah. Oh true crime. <laughs> so here's the here's the deal. It's the true crime account without without spilling all the beans. It's the true crime account of the FBI's Highway Serial Killers Initiative. It's still going on. There's over 850 murders linked to our nation's highways. The FBI knows there are multiple serial killer truckers still out there. And I rode over 2,000 miles in a big rig to research this story. I talked to sex trafficking survivors of encounters with truckers, who are the primary victim, by the way. I speak for them in this book in the sense that the dead victims can no longer speak. And it's, an, and it's a story of how behavioral analysis is trying to race to the finish line and stop the killing. But it is a deep dive into three cultures, sex traffic victims, long haul trucking, and behavioral analysis. And you're a good writer on the first one, but you're a great writer on this one. It's really, really, you tell the story well. And I just want to say this, lastly, you know this. I grew up in D.C. My dad was a Capitol Hill cop. My mom was a prosecutor. My sisters all worked for the federal government, two worked for the FBI. And when I hear about the deep state and the bureaucracy and all that crap, I just I get 
incensed. And, you know, I think that it's it's great to have you out there talking to people about the great work that these people do in 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 relative anonymity that saved this country every day. We haven't had an attack, knock on wood, on our soil since 9-11. That's not an accident, right? We yeah, the, the FBI the, the America is at peace because the FBI is at war every single day behind the scenes, and, and the American public doesn't realize that. But Trump has has really managed to screw things up with our institutions. And some of it's some of it is, is senior leadership screwing up at the bureau. You know, I that's in my first book. But but the rank and file FBI get out of bed every day trying to make us safer and our community safer. And that's that's what I talk about. Well, stay safe, everybody. The book is Long Haul. If you forget how to spell Figluzi, Figluizi, Figlazi, Figluizi, it's just Long Haul. It's a great book. You'll really enjoy it. We'll see you again, Frank. Thank you so much. Yes. Thanks, guys. Take care. See you, buddy. Bye. Thanks, Frank. What a guy. Really what? great guy. Hey. And he's, uh, you know, he's got a lot of knowledge, but he, he's easy to watch. Yeah. You know, it's important in this stuff. Sometimes people are, you know, it's like athletes. They want to be broadcasters, but there's a certain, uh, it takes a little work to come out of playing sports to talking about sports. And he certainly is one of the best at the law. Let me, blow some, let me blow some smoke up your skirt there, dude. Uh, mm-hmm. I've known a lot of comics that tried to do what you do and failed. And I was really surprised how well you adapted to the screen. Was that hard? Uh, you know, I, if you're so stupid, you just believe in yourself <laughs> that you're like, okay. And, and I started off as a stand-up comedian. I said, back in Iowa. If I could just get on TV one time, then everybody in my hometown would like me, which yeah. turns out not to be the case. But I I, got, I went and I got a job offer to do stand-up comedy at, the, or at Minneapolis. I'm like, I'm a stand-up comedian. I made it. My dad could watch me, whatever. And then I got a, ch- a chance to write jokes for Roseanne and other people. And write, I go, okay, I'm a writer. That's it. And then I got a chance to write a show. I'm a writer. And then one day they're like, hey, why don't you come on the show? Because people know that you guys are together and people would watch. I go, okay, well, I guess I'm an actor. But I've been very lucky to be in at certain points in my career where they're like Jim Cameron's like, no, you're the guy I want, no matter what. Well, the- luck, luck's a part of it. But, I mean, you know, it's good. You do a great job. You really do. Um, and we miss you. I want to see more. All right. Our next guest is, uh, is well, he's a businessman. He's a political analyst. You probably know him. He's author, author of a book called The Shadow Diplomacy. He's got he's a husband and a dad. He's got seven kids. And he's nice enough to take a little bit of time to talk of his Lev Parnas. Uh, joins us here on Really Political. Lev, how are you, my friend? Lev. Oh, okay. we can't hear you. Oh, wait a second. Hold on. I got you. You were on mute. Uh, you got to hit your mute button on your side. I love live stuff. See that yeah. little mute button there, Lev? Oh, there we go. There, there we are. are. All right. Welcome to Really Political. Hey, first of all, you know, to a lot of people, especially in these last hearings, I, I found your statements um, just this side of, of heroic. I mean, somebody had to say these words. You put yourself out there. People have thrown you around for being a part of that whole Biden smear thing. But you came out of it on the other side. And I think you've done really well. And, I, and you know, I, I'm proud of you. I think you did a done a great job moving forward. Thank you so much. Chip. Uh, you know, it's I've been trying to do this since 2019. That's the crazy, scary part that they've been trying to silence me and silence the truth all the way up to here. You know, and I'm blessed. Thank God that I was given the opportunity to actually come out under oath because that was the biggest thing they kept saying that, you know, you're not under oath. You're, you know, you anybody could go on Twitter and make these statements. That, and that's why I really wanted to go under oath and confront them and face them because the crazy part is most of them are complicit in this whole thing and they're sitting on the other side looking me in the eye and just dumbfounded just it was like you know it was really weird to watch they couldn't say anything they literally could not say nothing they couldn't ask one eight hours (laughs) and and they brought in like their their special hitter you know, Captain Venmo, Matt Gates, you know, to try to, like, you know, discredit, <laughs> to, to discredit me, you know, while he has some guy serving 16 years in prison up there that's testifying. And, you know, it's, you just, know, hey, in it, fairness to him, though, Lev, it's hard to do an inquisition when you're thinking about teenage girls. It's hard. It just messes up with I your mean, brain. You know? Yeah, I, I hear, I hear you. Kicked, you kicked Bubalowski's <laughs> ass, too. That was you, you, that guy was trying to come at you and you gave it right back to him. And what a slob. That was awesome. What were you <laughs> thinking? Uh, about Lev. Well, you know, I, <laughs> I was sitting right next to him and the whole hearing. Next Hang on a second. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. We're back and forth. Go ahead, Tom. What? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've watched Lev, his career. Uh, you know, he starts off, it seems like it's a cartoon thing with him and his partner and, and Giuliani. 
And then when he says, no, I want to tell the truth, 2019 or whatever, he, I know they tried to share stuff, phone records, everything with the, the, uh, uh, the impeachment people. And then and I talked to him, like Eric Paul, I go, no, this guy's for real. Like, and I think what's happened is you are very smart. I mean, it, it would be easy to go, yeah, he's a dumb guy with other dumb guys going around, but you're very intelligent. And you also paid you. a price. And you, you, you have, I know you're a father, but you also have young kids, right? Like I do. Yeah. And uh, I know that was hard on your family. And a lot of times people are like, okay, I'm going to go away. You know, I got this guy, good life. And and uh, I really respect. I also love that you have receipts because you know, yeah, <laughs> people need to see that shit. Now. I, I I love him. He's been uh, great. We've become great friends. And in fact, when I first just I go, I know it'd be good. Left parts. He goes, Oh, we know him. I, we're trying to do a show with from him without a house arrest. Like, oh, man, that's like, yeah, Justin's my brother. He's been with me from the beginning, and Chip and Tom. I mean, all you guys. I mean. I love you with my passion because, you know, it was the support that I got from guys like yourself and the people out there that kept giving me the push to keep going. Because like you say, not only did I try to share this with guys, guys, you have to understand, I got arrested. They tried to make it out there that it was an espionage case, that I was uh, trying to get rid of the ambassador. They paraded me. I mean, because if you understand what I went to prison for, for a campaign finance violation and a two million dollar fraud wire fraud case that you would you wouldn't even send the fbi to pick somebody up for that you wouldn't even the, the southern district wouldn't even investigate a case that small put it to you that way it would it would be a, i would not have bail i would be out of my own record it would be a, the news would never you would never hear about it but they needed see this is where bill barr came into effect this is where people don't understand he tried to save trump by making me the fall guy. See, Bill Barr understood that everything we were doing in Ukraine because he had all the intelligence services, he knew it was bullshit. He knew that this information, and he was scared that when the whistleblower came out in September of 2019 and identified me and Igor as Rudy's henchman on the ground in Ukraine, pushing all of this conspiracy, he knew that we were eventually gonna get in front of the committee. And he knew we were gonna share what we got. And he knew it would blow Trump up. And he tried to save it by how do you do it? He arrests me. Just think about it. They arrest me, parade me on a charge with unindicted co-conspirator one who was Pete Sessions. They dropped that charge after six months of parading me and making me look like a fall guy, having the media go uh, to such a degree where the, the, the Democrats were scared to call me as a witness even until Chuck Schumer, you know, spoke to my lawyer and said, you know what, absolutely, because you have the receipts. I mean, I don't care. I mean, it's like Michael Cohen. You might not want to believe everything I say, but you got to believe facts when you see a, a, a text message, an email, you know, it's technology. It's not like I wrote it. You could go on my phone. This is the FBI. This is this. I mean, and that's the most crazy part that we need to make a point and not forget is the cover-up that happened not only by Bill Barr, not only by the Southern District of New York, but also by Special Prosecutor Brady that was hired by Bill Barr to specifically root out information about Ukraine. Instead, he blocked all of my information. He didn't return calls to my lawyer. And then what they did is then they tried to seal all my evidence. So we uh, so because I wasn't uh, what happened was I got my subpoena when I was in prison and my lawyer at the time was John Dowd and he responded to the uh, to the committee. Go fuck yourself. So basically they weren't <laughs> expecting it, any of my, any any of my stuff. So they weren't thinking so. And the subject then Bill Barr went to the court and sealed all my documents as national security. So now the House Impeachment Committee goes and requests from Southern District saying, listen, we have the impeachment of the president. This is very big. Also, we need his data that you have acquired from that has to do with this whole Ukraine stuff, especially remember, they didn't even want to listen about the Ukraine stuff. So why would they care that? So they went to court to block it. I had to go to court with my lawyer to try to have the judge release it. The judge released it two days prior to when they had to turn it over to the Senate, the articles of impeachment. See, a lot of people think that I got a deal that, you know, something worked out. What they don't know is that's why I wrote the book, because there's so much to the story that you don't you, you can't go into one episode or one interview. But what they did is they my lawyer came there. And he spoke to at that time it was Dan Goldman, Dan Goldman, who the congressman is now. He was the yeah. head of impeachment lawyer. And Dan Goldman turned around and said to me, go to my lawyer. He goes, Mr. Bondi, he goes, we can't give Lev any kind of deal because we only it's the tw last hour. We only have a day before we have to hand it over. And he has such a voluminous amount of information 
we can't go through it and tell them like you know hand thick and say we'll we'll give you immunity from this stuff just in case if we find something and so on and my lawyer said no he had to protect me he said we're not going to hand anything over unfortunately even though we want to save democracy and my lawyer is a hardcore democrat wanted to help out but he had to have my interest first in mind and i turned around to him i said joe no you know what i don't give a shit they had the, the, everybody has my information anyway the doj the fbi give it all over to them i don't care if they find something, I'll deal with it. But I want to get the truth out. And this is the only way. And we were able to hand everything over without any deal, no immunity. And that's why out of the 300 articles of impeachment against Donald J. Trump, 100 of those articles or so are mine. Can I ask you a question? Because I, I wanted I know I'm, I'm I'm talking too much here, but I'm just so fascinated with this. I remember I was working in D.C. in 95. I was in the air at WMAL. And um, I remember Biden talking about Ukraine after the breakup of the Soviet Union. He wanted them to be protected. He wanted them to be brought into NATO. And of course, everybody pushed back Clinton mostly because he had other agendas. Not to say that it was contradictory to that, but moving forward, when I look at Yanukovych and Manafort and what happened, Manafort was working on behalf of Putin through Yanukovych to influence U.S. policy. And yep. then when it all fell to shit, and Yanukovych fled. He fled to Putin. Manafort comes to, to the states. Then you have the famous Trump Tower meeting with the Russians yep. and the lawyer. Yep. And then you had the, the RNC pulling support from Ukraine off the platform. This thing goes way before you, way back in the Republican Party and Trump and their, their this weird allegiance with Putin. I mean, did when you spoke with Rudy in these moments, um, did he ever express any hesitancy at, at, at being a traitor to the country? Well, they don't look at it. In that cult, they don't look at it as their traitors. They look at us normal people as traitors. They remember they have blinders on and they're so uh blinded by their beliefs that the they think that they're and that's part of being in the cult and what's so difficult for some of us to understand. And that's what I had to go through. I mean, if I didn't get out of the cult, I would probably would have been there right by besides him on January sixth and going standing here beside them, being proud to go to prison. I mean, like the rest of these idiots, you know, because it's a power powerful thing the mind and you know tom me and him spoke about that plenty of time i mean and tom you know speaks about these things i mean the mind is a powerful thing it's more powerful than any drug powerful uh, out there and if you could take your mind and you could close it in a closet put blinders on and feed it only one source of information for non-stop over it's like it's like torture it's like you gotta think about it. it's like if you, in guantanamo they would do that as like playing the music so here you're getting the same information fed to you by some of the most powerful people in the world non-stop every day eventually your mind shuts down and that's all it wants to tell you and that's all it agrees and you think you're right and that's why you see people are ready to pick up arms and go to war i mean it, that that's what a cult environment is and that's why i speak up about it because it took me getting arrested and i say that and i speak about that the best thing that could have happened to me as bad as it is as much as it destroyed my family and everything but in reality, it saved my life, saved my family, and saved my everything that I have going forward. Because if I didn't get arrested and had a, a, an opportunity to reflect and sit in prison in those two weeks and then come home and be able to now look at other media, speak to other people, understand, you know, you know that it might not be like that. And then the mind starts opening up and our minds are so powerful, it's incredible. And then you start understanding. And I started realizing that, you know, I was, this is crazy. I, I, this was not me. Like, you know, it was like I was on some kind of drugs. And yeah, so that's why I think it's important for people to understand why that mega movement is so, it's a cult. And so I know some reporters out there in media are like, try to are scared and say, well, maybe it's not a cult, call it like, it's a cult, guys. It is a cult. Trump is a cult leader and he's enabled by these congressmen and senators and people in power that enable him to be able to push that me message down to the people. And that's what it is. Now, when you when you say he's enabled by people in the Congress and in the Senate, you and your testimony said that Rudy was instructing you to do all this, but that you believe that Trump was instructing Rudy to do this. And then you made a comment Ron Johnson was their guy in the Senate. Yeah. Correct. What do you mean by that? Ron Johnson was their guy. How who's whose guy was he and and what was Ron Johnson good for? 
Absolutely, Justin. But very important, uh, your first statement, as far as I don't believe, I know for a fact that Trump was giving Rudy orders because I've heard I was standing next to Rudy plenty of times when he was on the phone with Trump and I could overhear bits and pieces of the conversation. But not only that, but Rudy, as soon as he would get off, he would go over the whole conversation with me to explain to you what to do. So it wasn't like, you know, I'm thinking or, you know, might no. It's a, you know, Trump, not only was he giving orders, but you have to say Trump is a micromanager. He gets into the weeds of this shit. You wouldn't think about a man that's so rich and powerful. Usually you have assistants that have assistants that have assistants. This guy is like, you know, well, he goes into the micro weeds of things and wants to know how it's being handled. It's like that mafia boss, you know, kind of mentality, which he, you know, I always say he is. So, yeah, so that's as far as that goes. He definitely was aware. Rudy called him after every meeting and would update him sometimes. And this is the crazy part. He called him from meetings we had with Pres uh, Prosecutor General Lutsenko, where he would then stand in front of uh, Lutsenko, that's the General Prosecutor of Ukraine, with Trump on the phone and go like this. Great job. I mean, I mean, wow. you're talking about you're talking about influence, selling political influence when they go peddling. I mean, you like, I mean, blatantly, you know. So th that's the stuff. So as far as Ron Johnson now goes, he he came into play when at some point uh, the information that we were getting, obviously because it was false, uh, the media wasn't picking up on it. Even Fox News wasn't picking up. Only certain reporters like Sean Hannity, because of the relationship with Trump and John Solomon, would push the narrative. Laura Ingram sometimes, but a lot of the Lou Dobbs. But that was about it. You know, majority of Fox would also stay away from all that Biden stuff because of all the others. So the plan came out and the BLT team, which I, you guys know, was made up of. Uh, Trump and Sarah's me, Giuliani, G the Geneva, Tanzing, and Solomon decided that we needed a push, a push to be able to push uh, the media, Trump, and everybody else that this is real. And how do you do that? As you get through the halls of Congress. And uh, that's when Victoria Tunzing stood up and said, you know, Ron Johnson's going to be our, guys, uh, our guy in Congress and the Senate that's going to push it. And then obviously you see, <laughs> you see Ron John. I mean, he, 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 I don't have to say, I mean, that's what I'm saying to you. you know, they do their own actions, their own stuff. Uh, they it speaks for themselves. I mean, and you guys also said Ron Johnson is also the guy that signed the letter as a Republican to get rid of Victor Shokin in 2016 or 15. It was, he was on one of two Republicans, Ron Johnson, that talks today and pushes, you know, this, you know, now, total opposite conspiracy russian propaganda did um do you think that um jordan and comer knew that the information they were getting from smirnov came directly from russian intelligence you know I, it's hard to say what they knew uh, uh, so this is what i'm going to say to you like this and this is what jordan and comer i know we like to make fun they're stupid they're this that but these are intelligent individuals, you know what I'm saying? To, to be where they are, to get there, uh, however you want to call it. I'm not, it's not a compliment, but these guys have enough whatever skill to know. And, you know, they're good at what they do, especially Jordan. He's a pit bull. He, he's not out there to get, he's out there to destroy, rip, rah, 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 rah. He's been doing it for 17, 20 years, whatever the case is. So th these are people that know their spot. So to say that they knew, didn't know that this was, was Russian disinformation getting in, it's a it's a joke. It's a hoax. And that's why I confronted them. They know the French. Now to say if they knew specifically if Smirnov was pushing it, I can't say that because I don't think they had interaction with Smirnov. I think they what they were doing is they like they do with everything else. They saw a, a headline in that 1023 with Biden getting five million dollars bribe. And that was it. And they didn't care about any other fact. They didn't even care about that. The DOJ themselves were telling him that we are not we this is not fully vetted yet i mean that that just flew by the wind that you know but you gotta remember that they went to they went i think they went to try question christopher ray or you know push them into handing over that 1023 because the fbi was saying wait a second you know we're not we're not telling you this is this is something you need to trust and so yeah it's like anything else they didn't vet any information they don't care if it's true or not it's all about a headline just like remember it was never about getting a true investigation to see if Joe Biden, Hunter Biden did something criminal. It was all about just announcing an investigation. And then in Donald Trump's own words, leave the rest up to me. 
Here's my question. Who does Tom Arnold play in the movie in this? I want to know. Oh, yeah. I, I have I have a couple of ideas. <laughs> I mean, if we, uh, Tom would make if we could if we could do you know some makeup and where Tom would make, I think could play great Rudy. <laughs> I think he'd kill it. <laughs> hey, what's up with Igor these days? Are you guys still in touch? No, I mean Igor I, is uh, you know he took re remember who Igor's lawyer was also it's Trump's uh, what's his name? Uh, oh yeah, of course. Lawyer. Yeah. Uh, so, so uh, Igor took the thought that Trump, because Rudy promised pardons back then, and uh, Igor thought that he was going to get pardoned. He took it really hard. I heard that he didn't get the pardon that Trump overlooked him, and um, he's, uh, you know, into his own. Just, uh, you know, uh, I, I really don't speak to him. Haven't spoken to him after arrest. So, Lev, let me ask this: Did you? Because you used to be all in. What I like by you, you were all in on this stuff with uh, Giuliani, Trump, all in. You know, you know, you raised money for Trump in Florida for outside the country. I mean, you, they brought you in because they were, they needed you. And you're like, okay, I'm good at this one thing. I'm going to go. And then I'll go, oh, you want me to investigate this thing? I'll we'll go around. I know a lot of people, which is true. And, uh, and, and then uh, for you to turn around, but are you surprised that the Rudy Giuliani you met and knew and went to a Yankees game with or whatever, are you surprised of the full circle of who he is right now and what is going on selling his con like losing everything but uh, seeing so much on the conspiracy bullshit that he's uh, women who are poll workers have their lives threatened because he's lying to people including trump about oh them being uh, uh criminals and now he's losing uh, uh everything is that to surprise you it definitely surprises me, obviously, because I always looked up to him. I grew up in New York. He was America's mayor. I mean, uh, guys, I mean, I was so close with him. I mean, I spent more time with him than my wife and my family. He eventually became godfather to my five-year-old son right now, Nathan. I mean, wow. it, it, we, you know, it was a really, I mean, we spent, I mean, even to the fact that Andrew, his own son, would get jealous and get into arguments with them. Uh, I mean, me and Andrew had it out a couple of times because he did, he was surprised, why am I there on a Sunday when there's no business and we're all going out just to eat? And Rudy asked me to stay over, like, you know, that type of stuff. So, I mean, we were a really close relationship. Uh, so I looked up to him, but uh you got to take him at his own words. I think he did an interview one time and he was asked like, you know, Mr. Giuliani, like your legacy, this, like, you know, and he says something to the fact that when I'm dead, I don't care about my legacy. And I, I think that wraps it up, you know, because most people want to want to leave behind a name. And I think with Rudy is he doesn't have anybody to leave it with, because when you leave a legacy, it's you really leave it with your family, your kids, somebody that will appreciate that could then honor it and people could look up to but if you're, you know, he doesn't have a relationship with his kids. He has no friends, really. He's he's a lonely man. And, you know, uh, the only thing he has is tries to hold on to that fame uh, and keep relevant in that mega world. And that's yeah. what I mean. Remember, let's go back to it. Rudy Giuliani won the mayor's office in New York. And he's got get doing his speech in front of everybody. This, I like this about it. I like this poll. And his kid is an Andrew, whatever. He was a little kid. And he was crawling Andrew. up all over him. And he just kept doing his speech. He didn't go, get the, you know. And the kid was, and then Chris Farley did an impression of, of uh, Kevin Dillon mm -hmm. played Rudy. And Chris Farley on Saturday Night Live played the kid. But I thought that's yeah, I a good As a father, you know, you don't, his kid's crawling all over him. What do you do? You just got to kind of keep going through the thing. And, you know, that seems like, that seemed like a genuine uh, moment to me. And it was yeah, all done. No, yeah, no, I think, listen, I, I think he had genuine, I mean, like during 9-11, I mean, I don't think you could fake that, you know, yes, sir, circumstances we talk, but you, he still stood up and you got to give uh, uh, you yeah. know, credit, credit where it's due. I mean, his downfall, I mean, look, everybody has an addiction, you know, and his addiction, his drug of choice was fame. And he sold his soul to Julia. It wasn't women. It wasn't drugs. It wasn't money. It was that spotlight that he wanted to be. And to be the, if he knew he couldn't be president, he wanted to be secretary of state. And he thought he had it wrapped up because of what he was doing for Trump that eventually, and when he was passed over and that, it became like chasing, you know, the carrot in front of you with the rabbit. Trump, he always thought that Trump was going to give him something that, and Trump, the, the crazy part is their relationship, you have to understand, 
they don't really have it. Trump, you, Trump doesn't like people that drink, and Rudy drinks all the time. So let's you gotta understand that. So he Trump doesn't take him seriously. The only reason you know uh, in that crew, and just like I say, Trump is a useful idiot for uh, Putin. They all are useful idiots for each other. Like the only reason Trump, Trump keeps Rudy around, I mean, just think of it. He doesn't pay his lawyers. He, you know, constantly screams at him, embarrasses them, doesn't invite him to any, like even if he invites him to the main parties or whatever, like he always says, watch Rudy or keep Rudy away because he's, you know, spitting while he's talking because he's drank too much. I mean, that's so it's not like they have a relationship where they're buddies and they're, you know, smoking cigars. No. Rudy's willing to go uh, to places and rabbit holes that, that nobody's willing to go. And that's Trump and mobsters need guys like that. Hey, you Lev, know? are you worried if Trump is somehow gets power again, what it might mean for you? Oh, absolutely. Of course. Not only for myself, but I, I mean, every, I mean, there's a, the list will go on. I mean, this is a vengeful, sick individual. He's a narcissist that is not going to, uh, you know, try to unite and fix this country. He's going to weaponize the DOJ and go after all his enemies. And, you know, but it is what it is. You know, it's like when you're at war and that we're at war, guys. I mean, it is, we're not, and it's not, we're not at war where Democrats against Republicans. I think we're at war to save our democracy, de decent people against people that are just, you know, out of their mind right now. And so it's, you know, and that's why we, everybody has a part to do. Sometimes you have to put up arms. Sometimes you have to go to war. Sometimes you have to, you know, be that lawyer in a courtroom. Sometimes you have to be that comedian that, you know, just makes people, you know, okay during that time of need. You know, so everybody has their job to do during a war to win that war, medics, everything. And my job is to bring the truth. And, you know, and, I, and, and that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to keep doing it. I have a lot of things planned, guys, which and you're going to be a part of <laughs> definitely uh, to, uh, you know, get the truth out and bring attention the next seven months is going to be uh, something else. But it's important because uh, there's no there's no if. People ask me all the time, what happens if Trump gets into your office? I say, you don't want to know that if it's like you're asking me, like, what would happen if you stand on top of a volcano and it blows up? What the fuck is going to I mean, something bad's going to happen so bad that you probably are not going to survive. And that's what it is. I can't tell you exactly what he's going to do, but he's going to stir up so much stuff worldwide and in this country that especially with that America first policy that it might take us a very long time as a country to be able to survive. So it's not even about me as an individual or Tom or you guys, people that, you know, are out there trying to get the word out and pushing this, you know, truth for against Trump, but the whole world. I mean, just think about Ukraine. Just think ask what Poland. To Ukraine. Lev, ask yeah. Poland. Poland is ready. I mean, they're, oh, they're, they're yeah. beefing up for an invasion. Yeah. yeah. So Lev, last week you released a new video that we hadn't seen before with Rudy and uh, <laughs> Victor Shokin, do you have more footage that you're going to keep dribbling out up and through oh, the absolutely. election? Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. That doesn't dribble, dude. Yeah, yeah. I don't think oh, he no. dribbles. No, no, no. We're, we're, we're dribbling now, and I'll tell you why we're dribbling. So we're going to play them at their own game. You know, uh, uh, there's 45 minutes of that video, and that's not the only video. I have 30 minutes of a video with Pete Sessions, Donald Trump, and Ron and McDaniel, never before seen. I have videos of the Red Room and, uh, meeting with Donald Trump, Rudy Giuliani, and the con you see the you gotta understand all those Congress people in the Oversight Committee know that that's why they don't want to ask the question. The public doesn't know it, but they know it, and that's what they're trying to hide. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna instead of because the way the, they do the media, if I put the whole video out, we'll have a big blast. It'll be a, you know go viral. It'll be all that, but by tomorrow. They'll change the media cycle. They won't. And another thing, just watch what they do. They do not respond to me. Tom, have you noticed that he yeah. has never responded? I went in front of Congress, called him a liar, told all of his other cohorts are, you know, uh, out there. Try, and he did not even respond. He didn't even call me a liar or crazy. No, he just did not respond. And that's yeah. a tactic they use against people that they know have facts and receipts because they don't want to give it a spotlight. Well, he also, me, Trump, he's never responded to me, a guy he knows well about like the end <laughs> and it's funny because uh, since he's left office there's uh tapes of his uh his crew his campaign people talking about oh tom Arnold says he has a tape of of the uh, trump say the edward and that uh, that pearson contributed she's like oh i <laughs> know that's true like that's a, now how could that not be true we have to stop that but you know he's ever i think he looks at us and goes i think they know it, what would happen if i Set criticized them 
Uh, I'm just going to hopefully this blows over. Uh, but yeah, very rarely does he, he not. Does hey, Tom, he doesn't even hopefully. No, I was there. They have a whole strategy about this. Is, you got to know that the, Trump specifically changes the news cycle. They have a whole game plan in the RNC, and that's why a lot of the stuff that he does gets buried. It's part of the plan. If some news comes out, right away they will come out, and that's why you'll hear – like, just think about it. Why is Trump going to come out one day and all of a sudden say, uh, you know, let's destroy NATO? Who's pulling his tongue? Nobody even asked him that question. There's a purpose of it because now that's headline news. It changed the news cycle, and whatever we were – one of his court cases or whatever bad news came out before is already hidden. And majority of America doesn't know because when America, you know, comes home at night, they'll watch the headline news. They'll read the last big news that came out because that's what's going to be the, the, the main article. And that's what it is. And they specifically do it. And if you somebody really and I've told some of the reporters they're looking into, I said, if you go take a look at how he ends certain days and certain news cycles and certain times, you'll see the pattern. You know, uh, Pascal was, uh, you know, one of the masterminds and, you know, back in the days in his camp. So, I mean, they, it's all strategy. Everything he does. Remember, Tom, you know about anything. It, for him, it's a scripted show. This is like a show he's doing. It's all scripted. Yes, he goes off the rails. It's it's half reality. They can't control him. But it's all scripted to the point where they know what, what it is that's happening. And they're using technology, like, to, uh, you know, a good degree. Sorry, guys, I'm rambling. No, no. Hey, you know, I have a great idea, Lev. Maybe we could dribble one of those videos out on this show. Oh, absolutely. No, <laughs> me and Justin, me and Justin have been talking, and you know, I'm I'm so happy you guys have the show going. I wasn't even aware, and I'm excited. And I, absolutely, you know, I have some fun stuff lined up. Thomas family, Justin's family, Chip. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll, let, let's talk behind the scenes, put some things together, and I'll get you guys up to speed on some of the projects I have going on. I think we could collaborate collaborate on some of them, and it'll be some great stuff coming out because we're on the same team. And and that's one of the other things. My message now with a lot of people and a lot of people in the Democratic Party and people in power, people out there that, that are out there like yourselves that are trying to get these platforms to give this message out is let's unite a little bit. We, you know, let's, 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 uh, let's, you know, this is not an election about policies. It's not about taxes being higher or lower. It's not about, you know, we could do that later. This is about saving us from a, a, a Hitler-like individual, a monster that could take our lives and literally destroy them overnight. And that has nothing to do with gas prices, it has nothing to do with egg prices, it has nothing to do with the age of the opponent. And that's why, you know, when we go out there and we feed into their, you know, narratives and we try to debate them, that's when, you know, they take because they do it because they take away from the most important narrative. Trump is a criminal. Trump is a narcissist. Trump is wants to come and destroy, not unite, but divide our country. And he says it. And that's what the message we need to keep pounding in a way. Do you want to have John Gotti? Would you have John Gotti as your president? I mean, there's no difference. No. What's the difference? I mean, <laughs> well, like, you know, I know that, I don't know about Tom and, and, and Jason, but I I'm a sucker for stories of redemption of people that climb back up, you know, out of a hole. And that's what you've done. And it's inspiring. And we really appreciate you being with us to share it. The book is Shadow Diplomacy. Uh, get it on Amazon. Read it. Uh, Lev, see you again real soon, I hope. Oh, absolutely. This is just the beginning of our story, guys. <laughs> Keep yeah, stay awesome. tuned. And, and guys, let's, let's let's do this. Let's have some fun and, 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 and save our democracy because that's what it's all about. Thank you, my friend. I love you. Thank you. Thank you. Love, love, you, love you guys. Oh, that was great. Wow. Yeah. He you went know everybody, Tom. Who there, don't you know, man? Anybody, when I first started tracking me with that, I was like, how can they help me, help my country? Not get past this thing, this menace. And then uh, you get to know these guys. Lev, you know, being in prison was really bad for his family. He's got young kids and younger, younger wife. And you, you, there's stuff you don't talk about. But but that's happened to all these different people. Even Michael Cohen. I mean, you know, he Michael Cohen lost his uh, law license. He didn't have a credit card. And his yeah. son, he was in prison, turned 18. And they talked his whole life about what kind of car he was going to get him oh. at 18. And he couldn't buy his son a car. And that, those are the, the the sacrifices that people make, that the human stuff, that they don't want to go, okay, I don't want to complain about this because, you know, but but it's a real deal. And you have to have courage to to do this. It's the right thing. You should have courage. But all these guys, I, I respect them. 
Uh, me too. Yeah. Um, well, that was great. Um, you know, um, I tell you, this is, this is to me, uh, such a great, um, combination of different personalities and ideas. And, uh, and we, we, you know, we welcome people to uh, send us suggestions. You can do it, uh, actually doing these shows you on YouTube as well. And, uh, by email, I guess you can, can I give my email address? I can send them to me if they have any suggestions or want to find out more about it. If you want it, go ahead. Yeah. Chip at chip <laughs> Um, we, yeah, we is moving forward. Of course, uh, we want to hear, I want to hear more stories from Tom and we'll do that in, in the next episode as well. It seems like it's an, and it, you know, one of the things I didn't last love and, and which we'll ask him next time is can Ukraine beat Russia, you know, and, and can they do it in a way and, and that with our help that doesn't end the freaking world. I don't, you know, you're, you're probably younger than me though, Tom, but I, I grew up in the eighties, literally worrying about nuclear war every day. I mean, as a kid, I grew up, do you remember, I don't know if you were old enough to remember this, but on Tuesdays at 11 AM, they used to have, Air, air raid drills when yeah. I was a kid growing up. And yeah. it was, it, this was not for like small missiles, for nuclear weapons. Yeah. And now they have, uh, with my kids who are in second, fourth grade, mass shooter drills. They're yeah. kind of the same scary thing that we, you know, I'm 65 years old. Uh, uh, I, I'm not, I, my kids are 10 and 8, which is crazy. But, you know, we did, you know, when I was young, it was, there was the impending doom, which is a hell of a thing to put kids through. And they did the drills. So now they're the mass shooting drills, which are basically the same. They're terrifying. You kind of get used to it. But uh, we both things could happen at this juncture. Yeah. Well, I I feel I'm surrounded. I'm I've, I've, two Jews and a Reformed Catholic. This is a <laughs> <laughs> this is a perfect combination. Um, all right. So again, uh, people, can, you can follow us on Really American. Uh, Tom Arnold comedy.com to get the latest on what he's up to. Are you hitting the road doing any stand up anytime soon? Well, I'm going to be here uh, uh, at the uh, improv next Sunday and uh, laugh actor, but I do a lot of stuff here. And then I do hit the road. I don't have the dates in, in front of me, but I hit the road. I do comedy and I also will do, I do those uh, comic cons with a one night of stand up and then I'll do speeches, sort of motivational drug, alcohol, mental health things that you go around the country and raise money for, these different things. So I got to do, again, I have four ex-wives, two little kids. I'm going to have to work forever. So I'll do whatever I can. Well, this I'm down in San Diego. I'm down in San Diego. So you come down here, do a show. I'll open for you. We'll do a show. We will. Well, that will happen 100%. Okay. Thank good. you. All right. All right. Well, good to see you. I good. look forward to seeing you again. Justin, great stuff. Justin Horowitz. Of course, the one and only Tom Arnold. I'm Chip Franklin. This is Really Political on the Really American Network. See you next time. Mm -hmm.